Welcome to Access to Perspectives Conversations, the podcast for bridging academic landscapes. At Access to Perspectives, we provide novel insights into the communication and management of research. Our goal is to equip researchers around the world with the skills and enthusiasm they need to pursue a successful career. You will get insights around the topics of scholarly reading, writing and publishing, career development, project management and research integrity, all embedded into open science practices. Learn more about our work at accesstoperspectives.org. And welcome to another episode of Access to Perspectives Conversations. I'm very much honored and happy to have Peter Nostoro in the house today to introduce you to. And Peter and I have been working at the Max Planck Institute for Development and Biology um, in, in Tübingen, Germany, about a decade ago. Let's not be reminded of the time passing, but much has happened in between. And yeah, what, very warm welcome, Peter. I'm glad you're here with us. Yeah, thanks for the invitation, Johanna. It's really a pleasure also to talk to you after a while. <laughs> uh, well, we have been this. talking in between, but yeah, to, to have this opportunity to go in depth. Yeah, there, to but... discuss a, exactly a bit of, more about the background and our career paths after our work at, uh, at the Max Planck in Tübingen. So really happy to be on your podcast. Yeah, I'm super excited. Um, also, like... I, I need to confess, like you've been a bit of a role model. You were a master student at the time, and um, a PhD. And I was always like amazed how committed and dedicated you are. How quickly you come to results. Well, I was struggling to get. I think we also have a very different approach to work when it comes to lab work. But yeah, so so that's out there now. So you are my role model. <laughs> And I've learned a great deal from you. And it was always a pleasure to go hang out and to, to be together in the lab meetings and to exchange thoughts and whatnot. So, okay, but now what happened after? <laughs> or before, yes. before, after, how did you choose uh, the studies like biology and then the the labs? Like how did you come to make this step? Um, and then what happened after? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so to start maybe with the history, so how it I came to Tübingen. So I originally come from Bulgaria. I was uh, born and grew up in Sofia, the capital of Bulgaria. And during uh, gymnasium time, I went to a, a school that is specializing on uh, life sciences. So my major there was chemistry. So already in teenage years, I was interested in chemistry and biology, but more in chemistry at this time. And then when I started uh, my university time in Bulgaria, I moved into molecular biology. I find this uh, intersection between organic chemistry and biology really interesting. Um, and then I realized pretty quickly after the first year, this kind of studies and research it requires really good infrastructure. And that's not something that you have in Bulgaria. And even today, uh, after what is like 15 years in the EU, it's still not there. So the infrastructure for doing life science research is expensive and requires a lot of time to be developed. And it only exists in uh, well-developed economies like Germany, Switzerland, um, UK, and of course the US. So I said, well, if I really want to make some impact and also learn from the best, I need to go abroad. And that's when I decided to move to Germany. And at this point, I already, again, was, wanted to stay at the interface between chemistry and biology um, and decided to look for uh, studies in biochemistry. And there are not so many universities in Germany that uh, offer biochemistry studies. So I applied to all of them and then I got accepted to the University of Tübingen. And yeah, then that's how I came to Tübingen in the first place. But then this uh, job that I had at the Max Planck Institute was also very interesting uh, because as a student, you need to work and earn some money uh, to cover your living costs and you can do different jobs. But I decided, well, the best would be if I can combine earning the money with something where I can learn. So there is this opportunity in Germany where you can work as a student a research assistant at a university or a research institute like Max Planck. So I looked for jobs there and then I found a group of uh, Matthias Gerberding who was looking for a student assistant. And I applied and got accepted and yeah, then we became colleagues. So that's how it started. Oh, such a lucky coincidence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I don't believe in coincidences anymore. Like if you're committed and you have a clear path of where, you're, like what you want to achieve, and even if you're not so clear how, like it will just show up. And um, mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm always looking for opportunities. I, I do take opportunities without thinking too much where it would lead, but ultimately mm -hmm. it defines my path uh, later because the job and the type of research that I did with Matt, with Matthias in at the Max Planck, it moved me more in towards uh, developmental biology and embryology, like away from, from the chemistry and biochemistry that I was studying. But this defined my path also for the next 10 years almost, because I also did my PhD in developmental biology, um, just switched the model organism. So uh, yeah, that, that's how this could be described. And also even later where I am today, this was defined by the work that also I did in the master thesis and my PhD. So, and these are not things that I particularly look for. It's more, yeah, things that I experienced. And then I thought, oh, there is actually huge potential here. And I'm very interested in of the topic. So I continued moving in this direction. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and now you are the owner of a company for Skylight. Yeah. How did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> and congratulations, yeah. by the way. It looks like, like yeah. the website is so compelling. It's also so holistic. Uh, so welcoming to new partners, but also the staff. Like so, uh, what's the word? Um, well, <laughs> Okay, I can't, I can't remember the words I'm trying to find, but so yeah, it's just so inclusive of everybody's well-being and and purpose-driven, while also highly pragmatic and solution-oriented. So all of that is coming together, and this, and knowing you from back then, it's a perfect like yeah, mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's so nice. So let let's hear how how the business idea came about mm. and what what. Yeah, what what were the uh, mm -hmm. opportunities that aligned for you or that you made aligned for you um, to, mm. to, to build this business? Yeah, well, to answer this question, maybe to continue on the story from before. So after Max Planck, I moved to Basel in Switzerland and I did my PhD in genetics, but continuing with embryology. So I was then moving from studying the parialis, uh, which are behind me, these shrimps, <laughs> to studying mice, similar embryo. Um, Similar embryonic stage, so early embryos from all sides to embryos. And then I realized there is actually a need to look really at the single cell level because the cells, even if they look similar morphologically, their RNA, their transcription profile is different. So molecularly, they are different, although from the outside or morphologically, they seem similar. And that's when I really started um, developing these methods to analyze these uh, cells individually. And as many as possible, although it was difficult at the time to do more than a hundred. And that's when this whole single cell technology appeared also in generally in the uh, commercial as well as a uh, so as a commercial technology. And and then I generated these uh, first data sets that were very insightful and really showed how an embryo that or blastomeres from an embryo that looks similar they differ a lot in their gene expression and that defines their next cell fate so you don't see it yet um, morphologically but the the rna is already different um and then we say okay that's really a different insight from what we do if you study the embryo as a whole or the tissue as a whole and i really got fascinated by the potential of these uh, single cell technologies and single cell analysis and i wanted to continue working with this technology one way or another but i also realized the more interesting part is in the data analysis because before this i was more focused on the wet lab part um, mm -hmm. also designing the uh, the mouse experiments. But actually, once you have the data, that's when it becomes really exciting and you can be in the data <laughs> for forever and always find something new, especially if it's uh, so dense. So I said, okay, now I want to move more into data science. And then I met a professor from the ETH Zurich, uh, a computational biologist who was developing algorithms at this time for analyzing single cell data. And as every PhD student after their PhD, probably that would happen to you as well, you decide, okay, so do I continue in this mm -hmm. class and uh, do another postdoc or do I do something completely different? So I had the same question and I was considering a postdoc. So with this professor, we also wrote a grant together uh, that could fund my postdoc. But then at the same time, again, by <laughs> maybe coincidence or I don't know, uh, I got an offer from a Swiss company that was at this time representing uh, a US company called Fluidime. And this company was commercializing single cell devices. So tools that allow you to isolate uh, individual cells and profile them. So exactly what I was doing in my PhD and what I was fascinated about. And so that's actually interesting because that's a new technology. And the job is more to educate the researchers how they can use these tools, 
what they can do with them and guide them also in the process so that actually the sales is uh, the sales are successful so i took this uh, drop and didn't continue with the postdoc uh, and i don't regret it. it was really a nice experience um yeah also coming a little bit from the commercial side and seeing how you can actually convince people to buy something you know you need to really demonstrate the value what they would get out of it and uh, how it would impact their research so yeah that gave me also really good experience and then some years later i still was uh, interested by the data science part of this and realized people when they generate these data sets because the technology was evolving and there was more and more data being generated uh, and the cost was uh, getting uh, down and most researchers they struggled once they have the data now what to do with it um, mm -hmm. many felt lost and uh, there was a shortage and even today there is still shortage of uh, bioinformaticians so they didn't have enough resources to actually analyze the data and interpret it and said, mm -hmm. okay so this is really the bottleneck here and that's also the opportunity so if you solve this problem then you unlock the full potential of single cell data and you also accelerate biomedical discovery so i went back to this professor um, with whom i was discussing a postdoc and I said well did you develop something in the past uh, a couple of years which we could use actually to accelerate this research he said, yeah, actually a PhD student of mine developed a really interesting algorithm, a convolutional neural network algorithm uh, mm -hmm. that specifically works on single cell data and could be used for biomedical discoveries. And they were about to publish a paper at this time. So we said, oh, this we can maybe take as a basis and start a company and build a software around this algorithm. So that's what we did. That's how the idea about Skylight originated. And yeah, then maybe another story uh, which we can touch upon is how we found the co-founder team. That's also an interesting uh, thing, how you start a company, actually. But that's how it started. So in 2017, we started Skylight. Um, now, six years later, uh, we're 20 people. We work with customers around the world. We have um, also partnerships with many hospitals and a really diverse team. So coming back to the point that you made about inclusion, one thing that I learned already at Max Planck was the importance of having a diverse team because there, there were people from all over the world, probably from more than 50 nationalities. And I really learned to appreciate this uh, diversity. And that's something that stayed with me. So in also later in my PhD, that was a similar um, environment. And then at Skylight, we're 20 people and we have people from at least 12 different nationalities. Yeah. Let me ask you, so because, when, like I'm also involved in many DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion discussions, I'm a big proponent. Um, but what are the measurable benefits of having a diverse team? Because we don't see it implemented as much as you have in most companies, despite mm. the service that is given. Mm. So where can you see on a day-to-day -day basis how this is actually beneficial also for the business and of mm. course for the human side of things? Mm. I think it's not so easy to measure it quantitatively. That's why there are not so many KPIs for um, diversity and inclusion. But what you can see qualitatively is really if if you establish such an environment and people feel um, safe and, and trusted in this environment, then it really opens up a lot of potential because people bring in different perspectives. And for me, this is the most valuable thing that you're not biased by a group that has always the, the same viewpoint, but actually have people who have come from different experiences, uh, different cultures. And especially in a company or an organization that is doing research, this is for me really important to have these kind of different perspectives mixed together. But also you need to have the environment of people being open and a safe mm -hmm. environment where they can share and learn from each other. Mm -hmm. So yeah. just putting people from diverse backgrounds together is not enough. <laughs> so you need to build also this uh, collaborative spirit. Yeah, and the trust. And, and the trust, exactly. Mm -hmm. You have a value statement on your website. Um, in the center, we have trailblazing with integrity. Mm -hmm. And then for, uh, no, what's the word for gluten letter in English? Petals. Yeah, petals. petals, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm a zoologist, not a biologist. <laughs> not a, not a... <laughs> um, so let's, let's quickly go through. How do you live these values in a company? Mm -hmm integrity that's mm. the base yeah, that's our uh, core value trailblazing with integrity and trailblazing um so we were discussing and we continuously discuss our values also because the team keeps evolving and 
we continue this discussion as the team evolves because it's important first to align new people that come in on our values, how we want to work, what we value, but also to evolve them and to make sure that the meaning is understood by everyone, which again comes with this um, diversity and different perspectives. So trailblazing with integrity for us means innovating and really pushing the boundaries, leaving a trail behind, so something that will stay and will have an impact. And with integrity is important for us a lot. And this means being honest, um, developing things that are for the good of patients, also for the for the good of society, uh, which as we work in healthcare, this is the, what, what we do. Um, but being honest is really important, being honest among ourselves, being honest with the customers, with our partners, and that's how we want to innovate. Okay, and stay strong and positive. I think that's self-explaining, but do you want to say mm -hmm. a word or two? Yeah, that's about uh, being resilient, um, because especially in discoveries and early R&D, many things don't go as planned. So staying strong and positive and always looking on how you can make things happen, make things work without being um, put down by some setbacks and failures. This is important and we need to continuously remind ourselves there is a setback, but then the next thing will be uh, something positive. So that's important because you would experience setbacks and failures in a startup, in, in a discovery organization very often. Um, Most of the time. They don't tell you that the started, but so the hard yeah. lesson. But yeah, no, that's good. Um, a good reminder to have that. Like mm. really said it communicates a good trust. Mm. How's it happening? Yeah, that's also important um, from our perspective as a startup because we work with many stakeholders. Um, mm -hmm. our employees, our um, academic partners, our investors and shareholders, and then uh, our cu customers from biotech and pharma. And they have different expectations and different ways to communicate. And for us, it's important to communicate in a consistent way so that you don't confuse the different stakeholders and that you communicate in a way that builds trust, which means you don't overpromise. you do what you say and you're really open and honest again. So coming back to the integrity value. So this relates to all of these four values around trade blazing and integrity, they relate with it. So that in a way they, they build it up. Oh. Mm -hmm. Love it. Mm. Does the that matter? Which implies that there must be quality that doesn't matter. <laughs> or does the quality that matters um, separate? Yeah. Um, it's not that there is quality that doesn't matter, um, but Amazing. here there's the, <laughs> yeah, here there's the balance between um, how to say it, overdoing it with uh, with quality assurance and being fast enough. Because when you uh, innovate and you're at the cutting edge of science and technology, you need still to be fast enough. Otherwise, others will take you over, or the discoveries will become obsolete and irrelevant. Mm -hmm. So you need to be fast. But then this comes at the cost of probably not documenting always everything and um, not doing not checking everything five times, but some things are important to be checked many times and make sure that they're um, correct and, uh, and the result is trustworthy. So that's the quality that matters. So we define the critical areas and topics that we need to really assure that they're high quality. And mm -hmm. there we put effort. And then we have others where we innovate and we iterate and we say, okay, there, while we're still in this um, iteration phase, you don't need to, to document everything. But once you move to something where you know this would go on into development and potentially become a clinical product, that's where you need to be very uh, very focused on quality. Yeah. Well, I wish somebody would have told me that for my PhD, because then you're given this still often paper notebook and say, oh, you have to document everything. Like I couldn't yeah. have been bothered more <laughs> or less at the yeah. time. I was like, why? I'm I'm doing repetitive things with no results. Why why do I have to write that down? <laughs> mm. Until you hit the nail and then you know, okay, now I have a series of experiments that I know are going well, and now we can actually start start the work. So and that's mm. when it's worth documenting. And also, yeah, like not to over document, but what I also read into this and tell me if I'm wrong, is the fear of or the the mis word, like perfectionism. Mm -hmm. um, which often comes with with scholars and academics and entrepreneurs um, to realize what is good enough 
to be taken to the next step and is yeah. of good enough quality as well or highest possible quality given the resources that are available. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and the resources, it's a really important point as well because the resources are limited uh, in a startup, especially in an early stage startup. So you, you just can't do everything that you want to do. So you need to prioritize a lot. Um, and that's actually a big part of my job as the CEO of the company always to to help people to prioritize um, where they they need to focus now how do we allocate the resources so mm -hmm. that we move and make move in the most impactful way uh, without wasting resources for things that would not make an impact and won't move us forward uh. yeah i think that should be applied anywhere like with many of your resources you should always uh, use a way for them yeah okay and then last but not least the the fourth petal Take ownership mm -hmm. and make things happen. Plan is better than perfect on mm -hmm. on your stuff. <laughs> so I, yeah, what's your interpretation of that? Mm. Yeah, so this is exactly my personality. I fully identify with the hundred percent with this one. Uh, making things happen. So for me, it's really I feel happy when when things move forward, uh, and I also always jump on things and and want to make them happen. But the first part, take ownership, is also important because making things happen could be a mechanical thing but taking ownership means you start feeling responsible for for what you're doing it could be small it could be big but you really identify with this and and then you're also identifying with the results so this is what uh, take ownership means and we also really empower our employees and um the interns even the interns that come with us uh, and work with us to take ownership for what they do it could be a small project but it's really important that they own it and they understand, okay, this is something that I do. I'm helped and supported by the team, but at the end, I own it and we help these people also learn how to do it. But it's important that they identify, okay, this is something that I own and I need to make happen. And I think this in a team, we always work in a team, so there is rarely something that someone is doing fully on their own without any support. Uh, but it's clear always who is the owner of a project or initiative. And it's mm. also important to have only one person who is the owner. Otherwise, again, the responsibility becomes unclear who is really <laughs> responsible and, uh, and the owner of this. So that's a rule that we've also established. For projects and initiatives, we always define one owner. And it doesn't have to be a manager of the company. It can be anyone in the team who feels they can take the responsibility and have the competence to drive it. Wow. And what does it mean to have the responsibility? As in, Because that can be a bit of a burden when it comes to what's with something was wrong? Would it be the individual employee who has take, to take the consequences? Mm -hmm. Or, I mean, ideally the company would, would stand for that and as a mm -hmm. team, as a whole. But what's what's that? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm asking this question just as an example because it's often hard to grasp mm -hmm. when people say, oh, you're responsible for this. Of course, taking charge, but then what if people fear any possible negative consequences that might arise from that? And that's also implied yeah. in the responsibility. Mm. Well, definitely responsibility comes <laughs> with the good and the bad, of course. Um, but for me, what it means, and for us at Skylight, it means really having the overview and thinking a few steps uh, forward for what you're responsible for. Again, it could be a project. Most importantly, having the overview and knowing what has happened and what needs to happen and be able to give guidance to people that work on this project. And then at the end, when when it's done, if the outcome is not as good as expected, um, or if in the worst case, it's a failure, uh, we're not pointing fingers and saying, hey, now you, you've done it wrong. We actually start analyzing what actually went wrong and how could have been done better. So we always do uh, these so-called retrospectives, so sitting together with the project team, and analyzing even when things go really well, it's always good to do a retrospective and see what did we do so well <laughs> that um, resulted in this outcome so that we can be aware of this and repeat it also in the next project. So we always try to learn from these um, setbacks and failures. And yeah, rarely we would point to, to someone because um, that's not the purpose of working as a team. Yeah. Well, uh, mm. yeah, I, I, must I mean, like... someone obviously, you know, full intentionally, missed something and did something on purpose that led to to a setback or failure that shouldn't be tolerated yeah, that's but otherwise it's teamwork yeah yeah that would be a breach of the core values and of course that's mm -hmm. exactly. either you're not with or not and then you find somewhere else 
Mm -hmm. um, wow. Okay. So tell us a little bit about what is what is Pilot actually doing within the products and services that we developed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mentioned briefly how it started with this uh, single cell data and looking more on the data interpretation side. So we're still more or less in the same uh, area, but it's interesting how our applications evolved because we first started with the idea, let's build a software that we give to researchers so that they can do their own research and accelerate it. Because the algorithm itself is actually agnostic to the application. It could be in any disease, any organism. And we did it, but we quickly realized we're not gaining the the most value if that's a software that we're giving to others. Um, and then together with our investors at this time, we uh, sat together and said, okay, what, what can we do actually <laughs> that brings more value? Uh, also something that we can drive really to, to the clinical application, to the patient. And then we started looking, okay, what are actually our customers or the potential customers of the software doing with this? So how do they use this single cell data and uh, our analysis software, and then realize there are two ways how you can use it for biomarker discovery, which leads to diagnostics, and or for drug discovery, which leads to new medicines. Mm. And I personally also think that there is not enough um, research and development and focus on diagnostics nowadays, but it's actually m even more important than treatments because if you work on uh, precise diagnostics and prevention, so preventive diagnostics, you can actually capture diseases much earlier. So then you would not need so many and heavy medicines uh, later when the disease progresses. Uh, and for me, that's where the focus should be put also from the healthcare system and reimbursement uh, perspective. We're not there yet, but on the R&D side, I thought, well, that's really an impactful area to move into. And then we started collaborating with hospitals in different disease areas, in oncology, uh, in endometriosis, in women's health. And there also we took an opportunistic approach at the beginning. So <laughs> similar to my path, how I uh, moved from, from university to Skylight. And we were looking for projects where we would see a clinical impact. If we discover a biomarker that would really help clinicians take decisions uh, for their patients better. But we didn't focus too much on the commercial perspective. And that's something we learned. So again, it was a, a setback and a learning that we made over uh, our early early years at Skylight. So you once you discover something, you need to, to see how it would be put on the market and who would benefit from it uh, also purely financially. And if that's not a big enough opportunity, you would not get it funded. Um, because let's say governmental funding could guide you through the or support you through the first steps but then later you need an industry partner or an investor to to put money in and they would only put money in if there is a strong financial case behind it um so that's when we did one or two projects that were not so strong business cases and this we had to abandon but then we learned and then we said okay now let's identify really an area where there would be also a very solid business case and this one was endometriosis which is a really huge market underserved. There is no molecular diagnostics yet available for these patients. Uh, and now we are among the first companies that have a molecular diagnostic prototype in the pipeline. And we may be the first to commercialize it uh, also in the US. And it's a really strong business case and their investors are interested now to put money in such companies. So this is actually our most advanced project at the moment. Um, but the rest of the company now, the discovery engine, this single cell discovery platform, uh, we decided to focus it more on immune oncology because that's also an area where we see a huge need for biomarkers to actually help clinicians find which drug fits which patient. And so it's not so much to diagnose the, the cancer diseases, it's more to match the patient with the right treatment because there's so many different treatments in, in the different cancer diseases, but it's really difficult to match the patient with the right treatment. And you don't have so many opportunities to experiment with the patients because uh, their survival time is not uh, really long. And companies that are developing new drugs, they also have this need to demonstrate that their drugs are better, more if, uh, having higher efficacy than the ones that are already on the market. And this they can only do if they identify the patients that would respond to these drugs. So that's why now um, the core business of the company is focused on immune oncology and partnering with biotech and pharma companies that are developing new treatments. And the endometriosis business, we are in the process of spinning it out into a new company. Uh, which will focus on women's health. So now six years after uh, starting Skylight, we were planning to uh, spin out a company out of the out of Skylight. Wow. Uh, yeah. 
quite a mm. quite an achievement. Congratulations. Yeah. Very much. Um yeah, like in, in the discussions we had uh, leading to this podcast, we were looking at or you said you would like to say a few words about the uh, way um collaborations can work and should work with um between academia and industry and specifically startups like yours was. Mm. I think you've surpassed the startup phase now grown into the being an established business phase. But how's your relationship with um scholarly or academic research departments? And where do you mm. see opportunities for for um, improvements or changes of these relationships? Mm. Yeah, so first on the positive side, Skylight itself is a spin-off from a university. Um, and this makes it already easy and natural to start collaborating with universities in the first years. Um, so we're a spin-off from the ETH Zurich, and in the beginning we were very close to the ETH and of course partnering with our scientific co-founder. Then later as we developed and started moving more in specific disease areas, we had to find also other academic partners. And for a startup, it's also easier to communicate with uh, academics because <laughs> naturally the teams all, also comes from, from academia. So you talk the same language. It's a smaller organization, so the communication goes quicker, which is a difference if you, let's say, if you have a partnership between a big corporate company, like uh, a pharma company and a university there, things go very slow and they're uh, very heavy on the legal side. Whereas with startups, things move fast. And again, you're still in this experimental phase. So coming back to uh, quality where it matters uh, there, it's more important to get the results than, you know, to have all the 100 page contracts uh, defined already in the beginning while there is still no site of discovery uh, yet. And academics, they also like to partner with startups because the interests are well aligned. So the academic groups, of course, want to publish. The startups want to have an invention that they could then um, turn into a product. So this fits well. And that's how we started these several partnerships with Swiss universities. Um, I would say from, from the startup perspective, still the universities are slower than we would like them, but it's natural and uh, you just need to accept it. But if you work with a um, pharma company, they are way, way slower. So still the pace of a university group is uh, okay. <laughs> for... I thought they were highly paid. Oh, no, no, no. So they're oh. like, you can imagine them as huge ships in the ocean moving very, very slowly in one direction, which also makes it difficult for them to uh, change direction. And they are very, very slow. So especially in early discovery, because it's such a complex organization, decision making is very complex, goes through many levels, that slows it down a lot. Whereas in a startup, it's a flat organization where decisions are taken very quickly. And that also makes it easy to collaborate with, a, with, a, with, an, with an academic group. Um, yeah, so that's adding on the positive side and the potential should definitely be used. And in some countries, I know that the setup is better than in others for um, enabling such collaborations. There are also many, especially in Switzerland, uh, many res research grants that are specifically made for startups partnering with universities. And of course, that catalyzes such partnerships. Uh, but maybe on the difficulty side, I mentioned the contracts. and. It's not that uh, we, we had very heavy contracts, but still negotiating the, the contracts, how the results will be used, when they will be published. It could be challenging, especially for founders like me that didn't have so much experience in this. So you need to get a good advisor so that you have terms that are acceptable also later for investors. Because uh, here, one mistake that you can make is go really naive in this and then have a contract in place that actually has terms that are later preventing investors to put money in the company. So that's one thing to pay attention to. Okay, on that note, we're in the middle of the transition to open science as a as a new form to do research. Basically in the sense of where open doesn't necessarily mean open but fair primarily and as open as feasible. And in particular, like the focus is still too much what I personally think on research articles where the actual research output is the data and the data mm. is by far not enough shared or fair. And if that's shared is not fair enough as in find of assessment of as in reusable. But okay, so my question would be, 
wouldn't that if researchers at scale embrace the fair principles and open science practices? Meaning, mm. as you're still doing your research and you generate research data that can, yes, lead to a research article, but you share the data in a publicly accessible data set, wouldn't that also help you? And then in a fair manner, like well documented, assigned with all the necessary metadata, and then Skylight can use that data to develop your product. Mm. Of course, citing the, the researchers mm -hmm. who have generated it and everybody wins, like yeah. first of the society, because then you can quicker develop your product to help patients. Mm -hmm. That would be amazing. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're not there yet, <laughs> especially yeah, with- so we are, We're working on it. That means yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would say, especially with uh, more cutting edge technologies like single cell data, because what what is really missing is are the standards so the standard formats and data that is generated in a in a similar way because one part of there is the interoperability which means if you have data sets from let's say two different universities and you want to do a bigger uh, analysis it's very difficult to pull them together because there are such strong batch effects in the way how they were generated but also documented um, may be different so it makes it almost impossible to merge these data sets and I think this is probably the biggest problem, not so much that the data is put in a, uh, some repository and made available, but it's more how it's annotated and how it was generated uh, in the first place. So I think that's where it needs to start to creating some standards. And they, again, here, quality where it matters, it doesn't need to be an overkill, but at least some high level standards that make these um, different data sets um, reusable and, integratable yeah so to to be able to integrate this data because just to to make it uh, more clear even now when we generate data on one project over time uh, also the the research tools they change over time <laughs> so if you want to compare a data set that you generated with the same group from two years ago with a data set from today it's still different because again also the protocols changed and uh, yeah just but this is also the nature of, uh, of science, right? Because met methods evolve, so it could be that all data sets are not actually integratable and usable anymore. Yeah. yeah. Or you can learn different things from different data sets. Or you can learn different things, yes. Yeah. So you need to be aware of mm. how they differ. And for that, they need to be well documented. Mm -hmm. Okay, so another incentive to push for fair and open data. Before mm. thinking about research, like publishing as in journal articles, which is, I think, also some some uh, open science people uh, advocate for abolishing research articles as we know them, but I think they make for a nice yeah. story and to connect different uh, research findings under like a, a broader research question and making mm -hmm. a story con connection. So I don't think we should abolish research articles. Um, but at the same time, nurture and and cultivate a sharing of research mm. output in different forms and formats. Mm. Uh, okay. And maybe one other point that uh, a challenge yeah. that we encountered in our collaborations with universities and also data sets that were uh, published but not actually open, is when you work with patient data and when you have a genomics data set, so it being DNA or RNA sequencing. Now, the regulations on data privacy have been becoming more and more strict, and genetic data is actually considered as uh, sensitive personal data once you have the raw data, because this you can use to identify a person. And this is also true for RNA sequencing, not just for DNA sequencing data. And there, what we encountered, if you have a paper that is based on a certain uh, genomics data set from patients, the data is rarely available. So you need actually to approach the authors and in some cases, you need to submit a new ethics application to the ethics committee to get an, an approval to use this data again for another study. And that makes it very, very complicated. Um, so just to give a practical example, we collaborated with a, an academic group that had published a paper, a really nice story, and we wanted to get access to the data. It took us one year to go through the procedure to get the access to the data. So yeah, that's uh, something that could be definitely improved. Does that differ mm. once the patients, the people who basically give, provide the data, or mm. like the the patients, once they're dead, is this mm. then public, public 
what is it, public domain data? Oh, this I don't know. Um, the problem is how the con the patient consent is defined. Because in the past, uh, I think it, it was normal to have more general consent that you consent that your samples and data is used for research without specifying what kind of research. Um, but now what I see is that these patient consents are more specific, so they actually explain the scope of the research. And this means, of course, if you now use the data for a different scope, it's no longer covered by this patient consent. So you need to get a new consent from the patients or an ethics committee needs to approve this new use. And that's what's making things complicated. Well, I think we should have a patient's agreement and consent form, which uh, is similar to the organ donation agreement, mm. which is not a good example from Germany, but in the Netherlands, there's a donate by default and you have to object I think it's the same in Switzerland, I'm not sure. Whereas in Germany, it's just too complicated and people are dying mm -hmm. because you don't have that as a default. And most people actually don't care when I'm dead, I'm dead. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. um, so, yeah, so you're saying data or samples should be used for research by default and only if no, people don't. No, 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 no. I mean, I think it's more critical here because also life insurances and it's like all kinds of stakeholders. But I think like at least when you're when you're dead it shouldn't matter anymore because then mm. those stakeholders have a different well they wouldn't have an interest anymore mm. but um yeah it's difficult I'm glad I'm not sitting on an ethics committee <laughs> but I think for for the cases that you've described it needs to be easier and and maybe the consent form can also be more general and more specific not to be well if yeah, only for this particular use case, they give their consent because they trust the people they actually engage with, or they're personally interested and committed to science, so they give a broader consent, like mm. yeah, do my data whatever you deem feasible, mm. and then companies like yours can can freely use it without disclosing it to the public on their behalf. So I think they mm. can put another security level or sensitivity. Mm. Yes, and um, I think one solution, yeah, one solution here could be also a digital platform, which, of course, in an anonymized way, uh, connects the patients to the, the potential researchers, so that always you, let's say, you will become the owner of your data, okay. and then you see how it's used, and you give consent to to the different studies, but okay. still remaining anonymous. Yeah. Well, huh, okay. Yeah, there actually there are some initiatives in Switzerland, um, like data cooperatives, where uh, that's exactly the the point. But there also needs to be changes on the legislation side for this to to happen. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, so we have work to do. Let's get to work. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Peter. It's been a, it's been quite insightful as always to talk mm -hmm. to you. Um, I'm glad, and it was really a pleasure. <laughs> nice discussion. Happy to, to do another episode on some other topic. <laughs> yes, please. There's plenty to explore also about Sky like that and mm. anything related. Okay, see you next time. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks for joining us to listen to this episode. Do let us know what you think. You can email us or connect with us on our social media channels, which you can find on our website at access to perspectives.org. Email us at info at access to perspectives.org or book a call to explore how we can support you with your research planning, management and publishing. Welcome you again soon for our next episode. Until then, have a great time.